Hi folks, Dr. Dicek. It is Monday, August 10th. I uh, hope everybody had a good weekend. Um, uh, lots to talk about in the pediatric world today. I want to uh, discuss uh, um, very uh, interesting um, study that came out uh, by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association. Uh, as most of you know, the data on children has been all over the place. Uh, especially at the beginning of the outbreak. And as you know, we've discussed on this forum in uh, several of the discussions, actually, that we really didn't have an idea of the incidence of COVID in children during the months of April, May, June, uh, March, April, May, June here in the New York area, as we've discussed very openly, because children were under shelter in place for many of those weeks. Uh, there was no school, there were no daycare or very few daycare opportunities. Playgrounds were closed and children were not interacting with each other. So we were seeing less strep throat, which we typically see in the warm weather. We were seeing less uh, summertime or springtime croup. Uh, we even saw less incidence of influenza that we normally see until the end of May. Um, and certainly much less of all infections, including pneumonia, COVID included, because children were not together they were not transmitting infections to each other. Typically when children are together in school or daycare settings, that's where they get infected with all viruses or bacterial infections. Um, when health departments wanna survey which infections are prevalent in the communities during the non-COVID era, uh, they would send surveillance teams to daycare centers on a regular basis to swab children and see which viruses were prevalent in communities during surveillance times. So clearly the shelter in place months here in the New York area, we were not seeing large number of COVID infection in kids. We weren't seeing a large number of any infections in kids. Um, so they looked recently, the American Academy study uh, looked at the period of the last two weeks in July, ending July 30th, and they compared it to previous uh, similar time period, uh, the two weeks before, and they found that there were 97,000 new COVID-19 cases uh, diagnosed in children during that two-week period ending July 30th. From the start of the pandemic here in the United States, there were documented 340,000 COVID-positive children, or about 8.5% of the total cases here in the United States. Now remember, these are uh, reflections of kids that were tested. They're obviously the multiple is uh, anywhere between five and 10. In other words, if we know that we identified uh, a million individuals who tested positive for COVID, that probably reflects anywhere from five to 10 million individuals because not everybody goes to get tested. So this study was very interesting in that it identified in a two week period, 97,000 new COVID infections in children. Uh, primarily in the South and Western United States. Um, and this is in co uh, confliction or a conflict to uh, the data that a lot of uh, individuals were putting out saying kids aren't robust transmitters of COVID, kids are immune from COVID, kids don't get COVID. We all know that that is not true, but now we have um, actual epidemiological evidence showing that in areas where COVID is endemic or epidemic or pandemic in this case, throughout the world, but in areas where COVID is very active, like the Southern and Western US, uh, nearly 100,000 children tested positive in a two week period. Uh, so we know that children, uh, uh, if, they, um, uh, if they're positive, if they're carrying viral loads of COVID in their nasopharyngeal or their upper respiratory tract, they are probably capable of transmitting COVID. Uh, clearly, these children all transmitted or shared COVID with each other as they were together in camp settings and daycare and settings and whatnot. Uh, there was a study last month uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, which looked at children under five years of age. And, and what they found is that children had 10 to 100 times uh, the uh, um, RNA uh, load of material of COVID-19 in their upper respiratory tracts uh, as older kids or adults did. So even the JAMA study uh, was in agreement with this finding that children actually do harbor significant amounts of viral material in their upper respiratory tracts. Many of them go on to culture COVID positive and many of them go on to become transmitters. We've seen that in summer camp settings already uh, as we've discussed previously, even that summer camp in Georgia where there were so many cases uh, at the end of the day. 
Um, so we know that children are very capable of transmitting COVID. Uh, the early data on kids was quite frankly very inaccurate because the data reflected mostly children who were being studied in shelter in place uh, situations where we didn't know the true incidence of COVID in children. Uh, the, um, the reason, by the way, also we're looking at children in the 10 to 19 year old age group, uh, and we see that they are very robust disseminators of COVID. I've seen that in my own practice uh, in some of the uh, communities I deal with, and it's believed by some of the researchers that individuals 10 to 19 tend to behave more like adults socially, so they tend to spread COVID uh, in a more social fashion, getting together for parties, barbecues, events, things like that. Uh, remember, Israel had a, the, reopened their schools at the end of May after a significant shutdown. Uh, and there was one school in Jerusalem where two COVID-positive children uh, spread to 153 other students COVID, 25 staff members. And when they looked at the tracing and tracking, 87 close contacts outside the school caught COVID from those two contacts as well. So I think the uh, there's pretty much universal agreement based on uh, the data that children can transmit COVID. At the same time, uh, it also brings us to the point of why it's so important to understand that fact when we're trying to reopen schools right now. Uh, and we're going to talk about this, and I've spoken about this on the forum before. Um, today in my office, we had four positive COVID antigen tests, uh, ranging from 67 years old to a four and a half year old child. Uh, three out of the four individuals were in fact sick with fever, cough, aches and pains, headache and all that. Um, what we did with all of these cases, including the previous ones that have been diagnosed in my office in the past uh, month or so, uh, is we've been doing very intensive uh, tracing, tracking, uh, uh, doing testing on their contacts family members, et cetera, and advising isolation and quarantine. This is the only solution going forward. All physicians are talking about this right now. Rapid testing is the only way to go forward. We need to be able to get results within the hour so we can quickly advise people on how not to spread this disease. And this is the critical tool now, especially with the data on children coming to light. Uh, if we want to get our schools open successfully, and if we want to keep them open successfully, and I believe that we can, um, we need to get rapid testing capabilities into the communities where children are living and going to school. Right now in my community, we don't have uh, many practices who have it. We have some uh, certain communities like on Long Island, there seems to be a void of rapid testing capability. Uh, we've been speaking to some of the physicians there. Um, and we really need rapid testing in order to identify kids. And great example is what we've done with the summer camp programs. Uh, the day camps here in the New York area, and New Jersey area, once we identified positives in the cases I was involved with, we immediately advised the camp, we advised the families, the kids went into quarantine, isolation, we tested contacts, and we were able to keep most of those camps open successfully. I think we'll have the same experience with the schools but it requires three R's that I wrote down this afternoon. Rapid testing, rapid action, and rapid cooperation by family members in schools. Uh, what that means is there shouldn't be days and hours of arguing over positive tests. Uh, this is something that I've been observing recently uh, in several of the communities that I deal with. As soon as there's a positive test, there's an inclination to go get retested and find out if they can find a negative test somewhere. Um, this is the problem. There seems to be a reluctance by certain individuals in our communities to acknowledge when they are COVID positive and to try to find solutions before the period of isolation is over. And in, if, in effect, they'll go on and infect others by doing so. So once somebody is identified as COVID positive, there should be no arguing, there should be no desire to immediately retest or retest within 48 hours. There should be immediate deployment of tracking, isolation, quarantine for all affected individuals and no delays because once you start testing and retesting and retesting, you clog up the system, you delay the test for those who are more seriously sick and quite frankly, you delay quarantining and isolation so you can infect more in the process of seeking out better answers. So I want to repeat, rapid testing, 
rapid action, rapid cooperation by schools and parents is what's going to determine our success at opening the schools and keeping the schools open in the near future. Um, I think these rapid uh, testing capabilities will help us tremendously, but it requires the cooperation of the parents and the schools. Uh, so I think we'll call it a day, and uh, we've got a lot of information in today about pediatrics and about testing and, and uh, tracking and tracing. Uh, tomorrow's another day. We hope to see you then. Take care.